My name is Jay Nash. I'm here with Katie Shorey on Songwriter's Vantage. I am here with Jay Nash. I am Katie Shorey with Songwriter's Vantage, and we have all of our friends here and fans. Katie, let's talk about the giggles. Could we? Men get the giggles while I'm on stage. Yes. And I think it's a wonderful quality, and that's what I was just talking ab about to Jay before we started, is that the male following he has is absolutely huge. And I, I wow. think part of it is cause probably the jeans and um, the jacket. These are not my first, uh, my first tier jeans. I, I, I apologize. Next thing is um, yes, Katie Shorey on Songwriter's Vantage. Yes, You've been waiting so you long. You ask me the questions. Go. Jay, um, when you were two years old, what was the first song that your mom sang to you for your nap time? When I was, the, just in case you couldn't hear the question, when I was two years old, the first song that my mom sang, sang to me, it very well may have been Obladi, Oblada, by the Beatles. Song close to my heart, my friend. We'll have to thank your mom for that. So, well. You want to hold the microphone? I feel happy that you. Do you want to hold the microphone? I think I would feel happier. Okay. <laughs> Tell you what, starting now, you hold the microphone. I will answer the questions. You did do a, a very beautiful show tonight, did he not? Do we not have the most beautiful show on stage? Your band jumped on stage. Let's just talk about that because, um, you know, he's been an independent artist for a very long time, forging the path wow. for people around here, like Hotel Cafe, family. Forging. Um, tonight tonight was totally unrehearsed, and it was a, it was a total joy. Um, the original plan was... Uh, Garrison Starr and I were just going to do a, an acoustic show and uh, just have the two of us because we've been playing quite a bit of music lately together That's but cool. but uh, the great wizard Chris Seafried was in the neighborhood and and uh, willing to get out of the house tonight and uh, Jason Kanakis was in the same mood and Freddie Bockenhäuser drummer he was so all of a sudden there was a band that, that uh, was ready to play now we didn't have a chance to rehearse anything um, we never know it they know the songs. We don't necessarily have an arrangement worked out when we work when you step on stage. So you have some excitement, some electricity, and and. Uh, See, we could. I you, I would never know that. I'm like, well, they all just know this stuff, man, because they were very tight. So. Wow, that's 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 no. fun to hear. It's uh, it's it's the best. I think that's the best. It forces you to listen when you don't necessarily have a plan. It's a lot more interesting than just, uh, you know. Well, we playing. didn't hear any clunker notes in there, so you're okay. That's, uh, that's reassuring. Thank there were some fun moments, but it was a beautiful show. And how does it feel to be back? I mean, I guess we'll just backtrack a little because I want to, you know, you've done this for a long time, and I'm sure you've got a lot of advice for artists who are trying. But just so people, you know, know of your music, it's so, um, you know, the writing is really, it sets yourself apart, I'd say, from the average stuff that we listen to. It's just I very, um, a lot of imagery, which I, I love, and just... It is very, you know, just feels Americana. It reminds me of Bruce Springsteen-ish kind of. I just well, that's that's a huge compliment. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know. Is that was that kind of an ever an influence for you? Oh yeah, okay. yeah. And when, when you said set, sets me apart, I was hoping that it was going to be in a good way. Uh, you uh, we'll call it. That. Yeah, <laughs> Springsteen was it was a big influence actually, um, not in the way probably most people of my generation heard probably when they were kids they heard born in the USA when I was a kid I, I was not born in the USA didn't necessarily captivate me the thing that got me was greetings from Asbury Park which is his first record and I was a, I was a freshman in college and I heard that record and I was like holy crap not that you sound like him but it was just clear and I appreciated that I appreciate that you appreciate that um, but I, yeah, I grew up listening to Springsteen and, I, and the band and the Grateful Dead and, you know, the, the meat and potatoes of uh, American rock music, I guess. How long have you been doing this and kind of what got you in? And you've been living successfully as an independent artist, just doing what you love to do every day, right? <laughs> it, has, it has been a little while. Um, <laughs> let's see, the, the, the summary, I moved to Los Angeles about 10 years ago now. Moved away from Los Angeles one year ago. So 10 years ago... In 2001, I moved to Los Angeles, and uh, I wasn't necessarily making my living as mu at music at that point. I was waiting tables and, you know, playing gigs around town. I played, 
played the uh, the gig in Genghis Cohen and you know all the venues around. Um, and I, and I found largely, I remember when I played the Roxy, there was a pay to play situation where you had to show up with a wad of money. And the Roxy has since kind of reformed itself, but you had to show up with a big wad of money. And the other bands that were playing that that night, they weren't very good, but they also had that wad of money, and that was all you needed was, you know, five hundred dollars, and boom, you got a gig at the Roxy. Um, and then places like the Hotel Cafe and Room 5 started to pop up. Now, Room 5 was kind of of my own creation because I wanted a place that would be like my living room that I could... Meaning you kind of came up with, you helped develop Room 5? Is that what you're saying to me? Stop it! It's a true, it's a true story. No. It, um, it was a separate owner, but it was the upstairs bar, and they were kind of doing a mixed bag of, of uh, programming, and I played a gig there. The bartender was booking the, the venue at the time. And after my third or fourth gig there, he, he said, you know, I can't do this anymore. Are you, you have any interest in booking this place, Jay? And I said, yeah, I know some musicians. I'll, I'll give it a go. You know, knowing full well that I, I, I could probably weasel my way in and, you know, give up my, uh, my waiting job at the Italian restaurant up the street. Meaning they would actually pay you for said booking. A little bit. You know, I had to figure out a way to sort of align it. Because so, the biggest thing to me was that, in this town, artists weren't getting enough of a cut of the door. And so I wanted to try to figure out a way for, you know, if you're going to play a gig and you put 20 people in the room, you know, you're at least going to walk with 100 bucks. You know, and, yeah. and that wasn't the case at that at that time. It, um, they were paying people to the play. The hotel, Marco and Max over here at the hotel were starting to figure out a way to do it. And I think at, that, at the time it was like kind of a BYOB thing. And um, they were, t you know, they were basically surviving on coffee sales. But, uh, but yeah, so I, I kind of got You were that. here at the beginning because so Room 5 and Hotel Cafe is where we hang mm -hmm. out all the time. We were just sitting with yeah. Joel. He was talking about Hotel <clears throat> Cafe. Yeah. About well, I mean, so, so, so Room 5, uh, there was a change in ownership in the, in the, in the place, and, and we created Room 5. As, you know, when the change in ownership took place, we, we, we renamed it Room 5. Why? We made the decision... We, uh, well, actually, it was, um, it was a name from way, way, way back. Uh, way, way back, uh, Nat King Cole played there, and it was called Room 5. That was the name of the bar, like in the you know, 30s, um, I think was when, when it was first named that. But, uh, so we came up with a name and uh, hung the speakers, you know, myself, I hung the speakers up and, 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 and persuaded the owner into installing a better sound system. Cool. You know, and you know, wiring it up as a proper music venue, and uh, and at first I was you know pulling teeth to get any of my friends to play there because it was a venue they hadn't heard of. So I was you know making huge guarantees and not making a penny myself because I wanted to try to get you know get the place established. And um, it took a little bit of time. It took five years, you know, for for it, it kind of took hold. And now it is something of a venue. I was able to pass the torch to Joel Eccles when. My, uh, you know, my music was taking me so far away from it. But for years, I, I played tours and I booked the place six nights a week, and I was terrible at both. No, you weren't. But I bet you got a lot of practice in. I did get a lot. Heck yeah! To where you're here ten years later, rocking the stage again as usual at the Hotel Cafe. But that's, well, thank you then. Thank you, Jay. Don't we want to thank Jay? Mr. Jay Nash for the birth of Room 5, which we all love, and what a great idea. And that's what we're about is the writing. And, um, you know, how, how long have you been writing? And when, what started that? Um, well, I was reluctant as a songwriter. I um, actually just wanted to be a guitar player, you know. Um, I grew up listening to, to Bob Dylan's records, and I was wholly satisfied by his records and felt like, well, he's kind of said it all. I don't really... <laughs> I listened to Free Will, Free Will and Bob Dylan, and I was like, yeah, he kind of he kind of did it there. I, I don't really have anything that I need to contribute to that. It's like, great job, Robert. Um, uh, so you know, it wasn't it wasn't really until I was like I think I was 22 years old when I wrote my first song, and and it was uh, you know it just kind of came out of a feeling of a little bit of a, a little bit of heartbreak, you know, and there was nowhere else to sort of channel that energy to. So out comes the song. Um, and then uh, you know it kind of stemmed from there. I don't write a I don't write a song unless I have to. You know, I don't get up every morning and try to write a song. You know, 
you feel something going on, and that's when you're right. I mean, most of the songs that are kind of part of the regular repertoire, you know, that they, they happen sort of instantaneously. Sometimes I'll have like that original, you know, the original template, and you know, a couple weeks later, say like. Seafried and I'll get together and be like, what do you think of this song? And we'll tweak it and make it, you know, make it that much stronger. But, um, but it's there. The body well, is there. It very quickly. And if it doesn't come quickly, then it, it, it there's a few exceptions in, in my case. Like, you know, out of maybe 110 songs, maybe there's like eight of them that I really worked at and like refined. But, but, uh, you are just inspired, and then it happens. Is it music think, and yeah, lyrics? Yeah, I think it's that way for everybody, you know. Whether it's a co-writing, you know, whether it's happening between two people or three people, like, you know, you're inspired in that moment. And you do it. You know, it doesn't take, it doesn't take hours to write a song. It just pops in your head, and you go with it, and you know what you're doing. Yeah, and so you, you just really kind of labor at it, it, then you're probably not being completely honest. It might work this way. So for example, is I'll have a melody, and it. Uh, it just keeps coming back, and I'm like, all right, I gotta address that. So I might like, I might, law, I'll record it and just set it aside, and then I'll be like, all right, well, this needs the right lyric, and the, the lyric, once you find the right lyric that matches the melody, then the all, everything just, you know, yeah. As soon as it's, you know, if it's the chorus or the, the tagline, you know, then all the everything else is easy. But that the, the chorus has got to be this sort of, you know, distilled, concentrated bit of truth. I do love to explore, you know, where the, the possibilities of where a song can go, and, and you know, there's a, like music is a conversation, you know, music is a connection, and uh, you can't just play the arrangement the same every single time. That wouldn't be music. The real question, Jay, mm -hmm. your words of wisdom to our young friends who would love to be sitting where you are right now. Okay. What might you share with them to help them along their journey? Um, Tell the truth and surround yourself with people that inspire you. Jay, lastly, where may people stay in touch with you, find you, catch a show? You are touring your butt off all over the place all the time. This guy works his ass off for real. So how do they stay in touch with you? I am on the interwebs at, this is, gives me great pleasure to tell you and you, www. I, th I stuttered the first one. W W W dot jnash dot com. It's gonna be hard, but how are you? How are you, baby? I think they got it. No alcohol involved. Zero. Not even what he's holding in his hand right now. It didn't happen. Never. Babes, we love you all. Thank you guys, Katie Shorey, for now. Signing off the songwriter's page from the Hotel Cafe with the one and only Jay Nash. High fivers, dude. We got it.